It was up the course of this last stream that Waverley, like a knight of romance, was conducted by the fair Highland damsel, his silent guide. A small path, which had been rendered easy in many places for Flora's accommodation, led him through scenery of a very different description from that which he had just quitted. Around the castle all was cold, bare and desolate, yet tame even in desolation, but this narrow glen, at so short a distance, seemed to open into the land of romance. The rocks assumed a thousand peculiar and varied forms. In one place a crag of huge size presented its gigantic bulk, as if to forbid the passenger's farther progress, and it was not until he approached its very base that Waverley discerned the sudden and acute turn by which the pathway wheeled its course around this formidable obstacle. In another spot, the projecting rocks from the opposite sides of the chasm had approached so near to each other that two pine trees laid across and covered with turf formed a rustic bridge at the height of at least 150 feet. It had no ledges and was barely three feet in breadth. While gazing at this pass of peril, which crossed, like a single black line, the small portion of blue sky not intercepted by the projecting rocks on either side, it was with a sensation of horror that Waverley beheld Flora and her attendant appear like inhabitants of another region, propped, as it were, in mid-air upon this trembling structure. She stopped upon observing him below, and, with an air of graceful ease which made him shudder, waved her handkerchief to him by way of signal. He was unable, from the sense of dizziness which her situation conveyed, to return the salute, and was never more relieved than when the fair apparition passed on from the precarious eminence which she seemed to occupy with so much indifference and disappeared on the other side. Advancing a few yards and passing under the bridge which he had viewed with so much terror, the path ascended rapidly from the edge of the brook and the glen widened into a sylvan amphitheatre, waving with birch, young oaks and hazels, with here and there a scattered yew tree. The rocks now receded, but still showed their grey and shaggy crests rising among the copsewood. Still higher rose eminences and peaks, some bare, some clothed with wood, some round and purple with heath, and others splintered into rocks and crags. At a short turning, the path, which had for some furlongs lost sight of the brook, suddenly placed Waverley in front of a romantic waterfall. It was not so remarkable either for great height or quantity of water as for the beautiful accompaniments which made the spot interesting. After a broken cataract of about 20 feet, the stream was received in a large natural basin filled to the brim with water, which, where the bubbles of the falls subsided, was so exquisitely clear that, although it was of great depth, the eye could discern each pebble at the bottom. Eddying around this reservoir, the brook found its way as if over a broken part of the ledge and formed a second fall, which seemed to seek the very abyss, then wheeling out beneath from among the smooth, dark rocks which it had polished for ages, it wandered murmuring down the glen, forming the stream up which Waverley had just ascended. The borders of this romantic reservoir corresponded in beauty, but it was the beauty of a stern and demand commanding cast, as if in the act of expanding into grandeur. Mossy banks of turf were broken and interrupted by huge fragments of rock and decorated with trees and shrubs, some of which had been planted under the direction of Flora, but so cautiously that they added to the grace without diminishing the romantic wildness of the scene. Here, like one of those lovely forms which decorate the landscapes of Claude, Waverley found Flora gazing on the waterfall. Two paces further back stood Kathleen, 
holding a small Scottish harp, the use of which had been taught to Flora by Rory Dahl, one of the last harpers of the Western Highlands. The sun, now stooping in the west, gave a rich and varied tinge to all the objects which surrounded Waverley, and seemed to add more than human brilliancy to the full expressive darkness of Flora's eye, exalted the richness and purity of her complexion, and enhanced the dignity and grace of her beautiful form. Edward thought he had never, even in his wildest dreams, imagined a figure of such exquisite and interesting loveliness. The wild beauty of the retreat, bursting upon him as if by magic, augmented the mingled feeling of delight and awe with which he approached her, like a fairy enchantress of Boado or Ariosto, by whose nod the scenery around seemed to have been created an Eden in the wilderness.